Amen. Praise God. And listen, right now, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Zechariah chapter 2. We're going to get right into God's word today. Uh, And uh, Zechariah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Zechariah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And of course, it is on the the screen as well. And uh, so... Uh, basically, I, I can probably just read it off the screen if I wanted to, but uh, if you're there, say amen. 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 Praise God. The Bible says this in Zechariah 2, 1 through 5. It says, then I raised my eyes. Now, this is a prophetic vision, okay, that you got to, this is so powerful that Zechariah has here. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with the measuring line. Hallelujah. Let me see that. I'm not sure if it looked like this or not. But a man shows up with a measuring line. So what do you think he's about to do? About to measure something. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Right? You don't have to be a scientist, right? If I go go here, I can probably measure the size of this. It's exactly 32 inches wide. So you see, the thing about a measuring stick or a measuring tape is that it is limited to the size of the tape. Come on, somebody. It's limited to the size, right? This particular one is 25 feet. So literally, the most I can measure in one shot is 25 feet. So it's very limited. I have to mark that spot and then measure again from there, right? And I can keep doing that over and over again. But I believe God was doing something powerful here because this man that showed up pulled out a measuring tape. Let's keep reading. And it says, in in his hands. So I said, where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem. How many know that this tape probably take me a little while to measure Jerusalem? (laughs) Probably take me a long while. Come on. Turn to somebody next to you and say, somebody, it's going to take a really long time to measure the whole nation. Come on, somebody. I mean, it probably would take me years, maybe maybe months and months to just keep doing that with a 25-foot thing. And it says this, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and its length. And there was the angel who talked to me going out. Here we go. And another angel was coming out to meet him who said to him, run, speak to this young man saying, Jerusalem shall not be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. Now, here's the promise. For I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her and I will be the glory in her midst. Wow. Praise God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word tonight. We know that your word never returns void, that it meets us right where we are. So no matter where we are on this spiritual journey, Father God, just meet us there, Lord God, and reveal yourself in a greater way. And Father, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity and the privilege that we have, oh God, to be with you and your people, Lord God, in this place. Holy Spirit, you have your way right now. We give you the freedom to speak to every one of us, and we just thank you, Lord God, and we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name, amen, amen. This evening, I've entitled my message, Limitless. Limit, in other words, no limit. How many of them know that we serve a God with no limits? We serve a God that absolutely has no limits. And I believe that God's will for every one of us is also to live with no limits. See, God, our creator, designed every single one of us, and he deposited in us all the potential not only to fulfill his purpose, but to live a life with no hindrances, no confinements. Come on. And yes, no limits. That's right. See, a life where anything is possible. Turn to the person next to you and say, man, he's talking to you right now. We're in a life where anything is possible, a life where your dreams can become a reality. Come on, somebody. See, I believe God has all these things in store for every single one of us. You know, I always dreamed of owning my own business. I remember as a young boy growing up, I said, one day I'm going to be my own boss. And, you know, I always dreamed that, but I really had no way of doing it. You know, you go through school, I joined the military, and then, of course, went to school afterwards. And then I worked for corporate America for 15 years as a a computer field engineer. And I never thought, like, man, like, how am I going to do this? Like, I have this something inside of me that needs to be birthed. How many know that even though your situation is good, even though you're, you're happy, 
If you're pregnant with something that God wants to do, come on, somebody. It's not based on the goodness of things around you. It's just that God has something more inside of you, and you're trying to figure out how it's going to work out. Well, praise God. It worked out really well. After about 15 years of being in that industry, come on, somebody, God launched me. You know how he did it? I got laid off. That was the best layoff I've ever had. Come on, somebody. It was right during Christmas time. Rose and I had only been married just a few months, right? We got married in July. I got laid off in December. Came home one day, say, honey, uh, I don't have a job right now. And it's Christmas time. So, you know, corporate, how many of corporate America doesn't really care? They were trying to clear their books before the end of the year, right? Make their numbers look better. So here I was. And, you know, at first I was kind of thrown back when I, got, when I got laid off and they called me into the office and said, here, give me, you know, take my ID. And we're going to take all your tools because it was all company issued anyway. And I remember driving away from that. And I was driving to another place because I have a friend of mine who was also in the computer industry. And he said, if you ever get laid off, if you ever want to change uh, jobs and companies, please come and see me. I will hire you in a minute. So, you know, it's amazing. I pulled right in front of that place, that building, and I looked at the sign and I said, you know, and I just, I sat there for a minute and said, if I walk in through that door again, I'll never have a chance to do what I really want to do. So that, that day I decided, you know what, if I don't do it now, I'll always wonder what if. How many know, I rather, listen, let me just tell you something, I'd rather fail doing something than wonder what if I would have done it, come on, and succeeded. See, I, I didn't mind failing, I just didn't want to live with regrets of not trying something for the first time. So I pulled off, I said, you know what, I'm not stopping here. I turned around, drove off, came home, told my wife, I don't have a job, let's have a Merry Christmas anyway. I, we got a little bit of money in the bank, we'll worry about what happens here soon. How many know God is a faithful God? He is so faithful. I, I, I didn't want to go to work. I was trying to figure out what to do. But the good news is six months before have, being laid off, I had started a little part-time business in the communication industry, right? I was selling long distance. And I was selling all these services. Come on, somebody. I'm going to date myself in a minute. Come on. I was selling beepers. Come on, somebody. Come on, man. I was selling beepers. Some of y'all are like, what is a beeper? A pager, right? I was selling pagers. I mean, come on, man. I was, I mean, but, but I started building the business. It started growing little by little. The company went under. All of a sudden, I was like, oh, my gosh, the people that were supplying us, they couldn't do it anymore. Long story short, I began to struggle for about seven years. I became an insurance agent. I kept, I, after that, I sold ATM machines. And then I got into the mortgage business and, of course, eventually owned my own mortgage company and became my own boss. Come on, somebody. Oh, that, that might not be exciting to you, but it was exciting for me. Because you know what I realized? I'm the best boss I've ever had. When I needed a day off, guess what? I gave myself a day off. I could give myself a raise. Come on, somebody. I give myself a bonus. Come on, the company's doing good. I can give myself a bonus. But I worked really, really hard, and that dream came true. You see, I know that God really has something in store for every one of us because eventually, even when the mortgage industry went down, right, it launched me into becoming a full-time pastor right here at New Life Outreach International. So I got the ultimate promotion. Come on, somebody. And I'm working full-time. That was 13 years ago, and God is just doing great and mighty things. You know why? Because we serve the God of, three, of Ephesians 3.20. Everybody say 3.20. Ephesians 3.20 says, but our God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, come on somebody, more than we can ever ask or think according to the power that works inside of us. Come on now. How many can say amen to that? Put your hands together and know that you serve a God of abundance, exceedingly abundantly. Listen, I want you to know something. No matter how big your dream is, God's dream is bigger. No matter how much you want for yourself, God wants more for you. No matter how ludicrous it may sound, God will make it happen if it's in God's will. How many of we serve a God that is faithful? Amen. The Word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, it says this, No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared. Ha past tense. In other words, it's already there. 
already prepared before the foundations of the earth. God already had a space and a place for you to exceedingly abundantly bless you and use you in a great and mighty way. He said he already prepared that for those who love him. How many of you guys love the Lord today? then God has something great for you already because that promise is to those who love the Lord. You see, he parted the Red Sea for Moses, come on, so that Israel could cross over. He allowed Daniel, come on, to take a nap surrounded by lions. He joined Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego for fellowship in a fiery furnace. (laughs) He opened the prison doors for Paul and Silas in the darkest dungeon you could ever imagine. You see, our God is no respecter of persons. That means if he did it for them, he'll do it for you. Oh, come on. Say, listen, you're talking to me right now, pastor. That's why I want you to understand that God did it then and he'll do it again. See, God is a God that has no limits. He is limitless. And he wants you and I to operate in that same unlimited uh, stat, uh, stature in our lives and the same type of, of thing is that God wants us to do is to operate in the limitless. Turn to your neighbor say, neighbor, I am limitless. Hallelujah. Let me ask you, what are the, some of the things that you're believing God for? What are some of the things that you're believing God for tonight? What is the miracle that you need that's going to turn everything around? What are the things that hold you back? See, many times we know we need a miracle, but many times we know what's holding us back as well. Is there a relationship in your life you need to reconcile or eliminate? Oh, come on, somebody. Listen, there are people in your life right now that cannot go where you're going. They cannot, and listen, stop trying to impress people that secretly want you to fail. Mm, come on, somebody. Oh, man. Listen, be careful who you, re- who you relate with, who you hang out with, because they might be your friend in the daytime, and they're talking about you at night. Come on, somebody. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. God is a God that will raise you up. And listen, your greatest revenge on someone that doesn't like you is to succeed at a greater level. Come on, somebody. Succeed. Let your enemies push you forward. Amen. Let them drive you so that God God can take you to higher places. See, are you in need of a financial breakthrough? Are you you praying for a financial breakthrough in your life so that God can do great things? See, do you need guidance in making an important decision? You know, decisions, we have to make those on a regular basis. Do you need guidance? Um, are Are you at a crossroads right now in your life where you have to make a decision? See, are you looking for meaning and purpose in your life? Because when you find meaning and purpose, it changes everything around you, right? See, is the fear, let me ask you this, is the fear of failure keeping you paralyzed? There are a lot of people who are just stuck, just stuck right where they are because they're afraid to move, because they're afraid to fail. They failed in the past, and now they just kind of are stuck. They don't want to take any chances, but at the same time, they're going nowhere fast. Or let me ask you this, are you just ready to take your life to the next level? Are you the person that says, you know what, I've got, I mean, I'm I'm good, pastor. I mean, I got my challenges, but I'm good, but I'm ready to go to the next level. Do I have any next level Christians in the house today that are ready to go to that next place that God has for us? Praise God. Well, you know what? To live a life with no limits, we must begin to eliminate. Everybody say eliminate eliminate things that get in our way. And you know one of the biggest is ourselves. Come on, somebody. We got to get out of our own way. Come on now. Many times we're the hardest ones that we have to overcome is our own self, our own our attitudes, you know, the things that, that we were brought up with sometimes, things that were spoken over us at times. Listen, we must, we must break through the barriers that keep us from releasing all of God's potential tonight. Now listen, in our text this evening, Zechariah shares an amazing vision. She sees a man holding this measuring tape ready to measure Jerusalem. You see, he wanted to see where to rebuild the fallen walls around the city. He was going to measure the city so they can rebuild the walls, right, that all had been taken down. See, that's sensible because a city without walls has no defense against its enemies, 
So that because Jerusalem's walls were all torn down, they were vulnerable to their enemies. But an angel came to the, to the angel that was talking, right? Two angels had a conversation, and it says, Zechariah, it says something very interesting. It says, run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls. Because of the multitude of men and livestock in it, for I say, I says the Lord, for I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Listen, God wasn't talking about the physical wall. The physical wall had to come up. But he's saying, don't, don't depend on that physical wall because I'm going to be your protector. I'm going to be the fire around you. So it's okay to say, let's put up walls. Come on, somebody. But how many of the wall of the fire of the Holy Spirit surrounding you is much better than any other wall, any other block, anything you can put in your path? And you see, when you look at walls, what the angel is saying is this, put the measuring tape away. God is ready to do, come on, somebody, well, you cannot be measured. See, what God's getting ready to do in your life and in my life cannot be measured. Amen. It is limitless. It has, no bar- it has no limit. It has no boundaries. It has no restrictions. See, if you allow God to move the way he wants to, then you got to take the lid off. Turn to your neighbor and say, labor, it's time to take the lid off. It's time to take the lid off and let God be God. See, you don't need to build walls around yourself for for protection because I will be a protector. I'll be the wall of fire around you. You see, even though walls are designed to guard you, they will also restrict you. They will confine you. They will limit you. Because, yes, you're keeping things out, but then you're staying in. Come on, somebody. See, walls can be great to protect yourself, but now you've also limited yourself to what you can do. And listen, I don't know about you, but I serve a God of increase. Everybody say increase. Increase. I serve a God that, listen, wants to prosper you, and he wants to expand the tent. He wants you to take up the stakes and move them forward and say, you know what? I'm not going to build walls because I can only go as far as the walls, but I'm going to allow God to be my protector and be my wall so they will have no limit. Everybody say no limits. No limits. So, so see, this is such a powerful prophetic message for every single one of us today. Listen, don't box yourself in. Listen, I know, listen, we've all been hurt. We've all had issues where people hurt us and, and, and talk, to, talk bad about us and who knows what kind of issues. And sometimes we build walls, amen, and don't let, we don't allow people to come in. The problem with that is we miss the blessing of of the Lord when it comes to relationships with other people who can invest in us and pour into us. And we end up isolating ourselves and missing out because, listen, God created you for community. God created every single one, one of us to need one another. The Bible says, don't forsake the gathering of the brethren together. Listen, we need each other, especially as these times get worse and worse going forward. See, God wants to do great and mighty things in our life, and we need to understand that, those, that we have built walls of protection, but it can also limit us and keep us from God's blessing and God's favor. Amen? Listen, do you guys all have one of these? Does everybody have one of these? Yes. All right, go ahead and pull it out. If you don't have one, raise your hand for a second. If you don't, all right, we're missing one right here. Anybody else missing some over there, over there? Yeah, in the front row. Yes, absolutely. Go ahead and give everyone one really, really quick because I want everybody to follow along tonight to make sure you stay on point. Amen. You're not going to nod off on me. Amen. (laughs) You got to stay engaged in the message. And see, to live a life with no limits, certain walls need to come down. Certain walls need to come. And the first one is this, fill in the blanks. Walls of negative thinking. Oh, come on, somebody. Stinking thinking. Oh, negative, negative. Oh, whining and complaining. Always murmuring about stuff. Oh, the food is too hot. Oh, the food is too cold. Oh, I don't like the food at all. Listen, people complain and whine so much. I don't know about you. But next time somebody whines around you and starts just going to that negative talk, listen, tell them Pastor Carlos gave me permission to tell them to just shut up. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Just say, yo, if you can't say something good, just stay quiet. 
Uh, just stay quiet, because at the end of the day, doesn't it get you like, uh, seriously, I mean, if you look at God's blessings, why are you complaining? I don't know about you, but God didn't design whiners, he designed winners. Amen. Oh, come on. Listen, you're either a winner or a whiner, but you can't be both, because why, winners don't whine. Winners, come on, somebody, they step into the game, and they're, listen, they may have the same uh, situations, the same obstacles, but they're not going to whine about it. Come on, somebody, they're going to step into the game, because I don't know about you, but I'm in it to win it. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm in it to win it. Come on, we're in this thing to go all the way. So Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7 says this, "For for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. See, a positive thinker sees opportunities in every difficulty. A negative thinker sees difficulties in every opportunity. Don't you just get, don't you just get people that you share an opportunity with them and they find every reason why it can't happen. I mean, people say that. I'm like, you know what? Don't tell me how it can't. Tell me how you can make it happen. There's such a different mindset. A mindset is like, like, it's like when the opportunity arises, you know, I remember a story about two salesmen that were, that were shoe salesmen. And, it, and they, of course, they both went, they're different companies, but they both went to Africa to this little village to sell shoes. Well, of course, they looked around the village and guess what? Nobody had shoes. <laughs> they didn't wear shoes. So one of the salesmen called back to his company and said, man, forget this. There's no shoes around. They don't wear shoes around here. They're not used to that. Let me just go find somewhere else. The other salesman went, guess what? They don't have shoes. This market is wide open. Come on, somebody. We're going to go ahead and put all the shoes on everybody's feet. We're going to make a fortune right up in here selling shoes. You see, it depends on your attitude. It depends on your thinking. So you can see the opportunity or you can look at it as as an obstacle or as a difficulty. You see, an Indian chief grabbed some young braves one day sitting around a campfire And of course, the young braves were just listening to the wisdom that the Indian chief was sharing. And he said, you know, he said, the Indian chief says, you know, everyone has two wolves always on their mind, a good wolf and a bad wolf. And they're always fighting. And the young young brave says, well, who, who wins? Who wins the battle? And of course, the Indian chief says, the one that you feed. The one that you feed. If you feed yourself with negativity, it's just going to be the negative all the time. But if you feed yourself the things like the word of God, amen, you see the Bible clearly instructs us on how to feed our minds. Look what Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 says. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good rapport, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate, think on these things. Come on, somebody. God just laid out the formula, come on, somebody, to get rid of stinking thinking and begin to feed yourself and feed your mind what it needs to be transformed and renewed. Listen, what goes in your mind comes out of your life. I got to say that one more time. What goes in your mind comes out of your life. See, so often our mindset will keep us from experiencing God's best. See, in the book of Numbers, chapter 13, we know the story. They sent out 12 12 spies to go out and spy the land. When they came back, they had two different reports. You had the negative report. Did you notice there was 10 of them with the negative report? You know what that tells me? That most of the time, the majority of people are negative. Come on, somebody. That just tells you, listen, finding positive people is not that easy. So 10 of them said, man, there's no way. Uh, these, these giants are huge. I mean, we look like grasshoppers around them. Listen, no, the, they didn't talk to the giants. <laughs> the giants never said you look like grasshoppers. They self-imposed that and spoke that over themselves that they were too small, that they looked like grasshoppers. Of course, Joseph and Caleb said, oh, my goodness. There's giants in the land. 
but the God I serve, come on somebody, is bigger than any giant. The God I serve, he promised us the land. I say we go in and possess the land. And of course, we know the story. The leaders decided to go with the majority. The majority ruled. And because of that decision, the people of Israel spent 40 years 40 years wandering in the desert. Did you know that the decisions you make affect other people around you as well? Oh, come on, somebody. See, when you make a decision, consider the fact that others around you will be impacted by that as well. And you see, God did something great and mighty. And of course, some of them came back with a negative report. See, many of us may be roaming in the desert right now. Some of us may be in a wilderness time right now. Listen, uh, allow this wilderness to do something in your life. You see, our negative mindset will have us drifting in the desert instead of possessing God's promises. See, we may have to be in the desert long enough till we understand, until we learn, come on somebody, that God has something for us. And most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the time, when you've learned your lesson in the desert, come on somebody, he's going to take you to a higher mountain. Come on, promotion comes after the wilderness. So if you're in the wilderness right now, listen, be saying hallelujah, it's challenging, it's difficult, but I serve a God of promotion, and he's working something out in the valley because he's getting ready to take me to a mountaintop, and I'm learning something in the valley I can't learn anywhere else. And you see, God's going to promote you. He always does, but he'll always put you in a valley first. You see, our negative mindset will do that. But Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says this, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joint and marrow. Come on, somebody. And of positive and negative. Um, I'm just putting that in there. And is discerning of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Listen, allow the sword of the spirit to carve out that negativity all that stuff and get it out of your life and give you direction and purpose. Psalms 119, 105 says this, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Listen, you got to get your mindset straight so then God's word can direct you and guide you. But that same word that directs you is also the same word that will take, hallelujah, that will cut through all the stuff and get to the core of your issue and heal that area, amen, and take anything that needs to come out. Out. Listen, negative thinking is like a tumor. Come on, somebody. And it needs to be removed. It needs to come out. There's no room in your body, in your heart, in your mind for any tumors of negativity. Amen. See, tear down the walls of negative thinking, and that will lead you to a life, come on, somebody, of limitlessness. The second thing is this. Write this down. It's in, the, it's in your notes. Walls of unforgiveness. Walls of unforgiveness will hold you back more than anything else. Psalms 86 verse 5 says this, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all of those who call upon you. See, our God is a good guy. We say good God. Good God Almighty. We serve a good God, always ready to forgive. And because God created us in his image, we need to express his forgiving nature to others. Unfortunately, many of us have experienced many deep wounds and been hurt at one point or another. Listen, we've all been there. Come on, somebody. None of us are exempt of some of the things that have happened to us in the past. See, maybe it's a betrayal of a close friend. Maybe it was a marriage that ended in divorce. Perhaps you felt abandoned or rejected by someone you loved. And trusted, or maybe you just lost somebody you cared for. See, the pain is real, and I know it's hard, but we can't stay there. Come on, somebody. See, you may have to pass through a season, but that season can't become a cycle that you just stay there, amen? You have to eventually move on from that place. And if you're still six feet above the ground, if you're still breathing, that means God has a plan and a purpose for your life, and we need to continue to move on. You see, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Come on, somebody. Listen, forgiving someone may cost you your pride, but not forgiving them will cost you your freedom. 
See, at the end of the day, see, we, we think that, oh, somebody did me wrong. I have the right to, to be unforgiving. Listen, the only, putting you, the only person you're putting in prison is yourself. Because you're trapped in that thing. And unforgiveness, the Bible goes even further. This is so challenging. Every time I read this, see, if you're holding on to any unforgiveness against your, listen, even yourself. Oh, come on. Did you know that, un, that not forgiving yourself is a sin? It got quiet all of a sudden. Not for, see, if God forgave you, who are you not to forgive yourself? If God already pardoned you for what happened in your life, then don't, you're holding on to sin. Oh, come on, somebody. Disobedience. You know, ask God to heal you. Ask God to help you forgive yourself of your past. Don't hold on to that. It's killing you. It's holding you back. See, God commands us to forgive because what we do for others... God does for us. It goes even further. Look what Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15 says. For if, you get, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But watch this. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Wow. That means God's forgiveness is directly proportional, directly tied to the forgiveness that you give others. I don't know about you, but when you look at that scripture, I don't know, you need to search our, we need to search our hearts and make sure we're not holding on to stuff because it could be hindering our lives because when you ask God for forgiveness, he says, nope, I tell you what, you go forgive your brother and then I'll forgive you. You forgive that person that hurt you first, and then I'll forgive you. Because at the end of the day, how many know it's easy to love those that love us? But can we forgive and love those that hurt us? That's not an easy thing to do. I believe that's a supernatural gift from God to be able to do that. But God is more than able to make that happen in our lives so we can walk in that as well. You see, all of us need God's forgiveness on a regular basis. The Bible says that all have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. We consistently are leaning on God's forgiveness. But if we want God to forgive us, we need to forgive others. So you see, forgiveness is another key to living limitless. Come on. And the last thing is this. The third thing is this. Walls of unbelief. Well, fill in the blanks. Wall of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says this. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those. Everybody say rewarder. He's a rewarder of those that diligently, persistently, with keen focus, seek him. See, to live a life with no limits, we need to have faith in God. See, God wants to meet every need, but he'll only meet the needs in your life if you believe that he can. So many times we fall, we we're wondering why God is not meeting our needs. Listen, God doesn't meet your needs. Come on, somebody. God honors the faith that you have that he will meet your need. So you see, God wants, to get, God wants that faith in our lives. That's why it's so important to be in church. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. You see, faith, see, when you, I don't know about you, listen, when you read your Bible, you need to read it out loud. Come on, somebody. You need to read it out loud so you can hear your own words, and that begins to cause a cycle of faith. So as you're reading, you're reading it, it's going into your heart, and you're listening to it. So faith is built up. So read the word of God out loud. See, God wants to meet your needs. See, faith sees the invisible. Come on, somebody. Believes the unreal. Receives the impossible. See, faith is what totally unlocks everything that God has. The problem is that many of us put faith, put our faith, yeah, we have faith, but we have faith in all the wrong things. We'll put our faith and trust in other things. See, we put our faith and trust in our own abilities and then we, then we get frustrated because things aren't working out the way we think they should. We put our faith in people, and then people let us down. We put our faith in our money, come on somebody, and later realize that money never satisfies. Money in itself never does. Listen, it's great to have it. It's great to use it. God can use your money to advance God's kingdom and do what you need to do with it. See, but I believe this, money will never satisfy you. It just never will. The more money you have, hallelujah, the more you have to get people to help you keep it. 
because at the end of the day, you know, you got to get accountants, and, and people, people don't realize when I had my mortgage company, you know, you, you're, you're fighting not to make the money, you're fighting how to keep it, <laughs> because everybody's dipping into your pockets, right? So at the end of the day, it just doesn't satisfy. It just never will. I know a lot of people that have an awful lot of money, but they're also very miserable, because, because money won't do it. Without Jesus Christ in our hearts, come on, the void that we have can only be filled by him. Amen. You see, prayer may be the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. Faith unlocks the door. See, a life with no limits makes serving God a priority. It makes serving God a priority. Listen, that kind of faith that makes God a priority is the kind of faith that takes the lid off. It just takes the lid off of God and say, God, I'm not going to try to compartmentalize you. I'm not, I'm not going to try to limit you. If you're the God of the Bible that I read, if you get part C's and you can do all these great, if the sick were healed and the blind eyes were open and the ears were open to the deaf, then what limits do you really have? I believe the only limits we have are the limits that we put on God. See, God is only as big as you make him in your life. See, we serve a big God, but he can be limited by your faith and what you believe as well. You see, there's a famous experiment. There's a famous experiment. If you read about this, you can actually find this, where they took f fleas. How many know fleas jump? <laughs> fleas actually jump 100 times their weight. So they jump, and fleas can jump. How many have had fleas jump all over them? Come on, somebody. Have the dog come in the house with a bunch of fleas. Well, so, so when you, they, they, they did this whole experiment, and they put fleas inside of a jar, right? And then so, so then they, they put the jar, and they covered it up, and all the fleas just uh, began to just hit the cover, right? But eventually, they realized that when they jumped to a certain distance, it hurt. Come on, somebody. I mean, if you keep hitting the, hitting the ceiling, you keep bouncing off, eventually, it kind of hurts, so they realized as they kept jumping up and down, because fleas are a lot smarter than you think, they began to limit how high they jump. Jumping this high, it hurts. But they began to measure their jumps, right? They measured it to the place where they could actually limit their jumps, and then they wouldn't hit the, 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 the lid anymore. Now, that was so interesting, right? Because here I have a lid covering something, right? And, and I thought, so if you take the lid off, they took the lid off later, and guess what? They never jumped out. They only, they were programmed to only jump to a certain distance, and then they would stop right there. So even when the lid was gone, they still were limited because their brain was already programmed, come on somebody, to only go so far. Now it gets a little deeper than that. I kept reading and it said this, not only did they limit themselves, but they also reprogram their children. Oh, come on, somebody. All the little baby fleas, all the little baby fleas, also because it was passed down to the next generation, they were all programmed to be limited. Oh, come on, somebody. Some of y'all, y'all gonna get this in a moment because the Bible says that sometimes sin goes from generation to generation. Listen, I'm here to tell you something today. Just because your dad was an alcoholic doesn't mean you have to be. Just because your house was broken doesn't mean your house has to be broken. Just because you were limited when you were growing up doesn't mean that that has to be passed down to the next generation, amen? See, God is a God that breaks generational curses. But you see, it was so powerful. It was powerful to see that they actually transferred it down just like we do. But something happens when you and I realize that the lid is no longer there. If we could just get to that place in our faith. Listen, we've hit our head a few times. We failed on a lot. I mean, this lid, come on, we've hit that thing so many times. Now we're afraid to go any higher because every time we try something, we fail. I'm here to tell you that something great happens when you begin to decide to take the lid off, when you decide to live limitless. Oh, come on. Some of y'all don't know. I mean, somebody should be shouting just a little bit up in here. Am I the only one excited? Come on. I need a little help in here. At the end of the day, what happens when you take the lid off? What happens when one day you decide enough is enough? I don't care. I'm taking the lid off. And when I do, I believe God's going to do something amazing. I believe the power of God is going to move. I believe it's going to blow up everywhere. I believe there'll be no limits to what God can do. 
Oh, come on, somebody. Give the Lord a good praise. You see, when you take the limit off, God can blow up. Come on, somebody. And there's no limit to what you can do when you walk in that limit, limitless spirit as well. And I want to encourage you tonight as I end this service. It's time to walk with no limits. It's time to open our minds and get past all our stuff. Listen, it's time to stop having pity parties. Oh, come on. I'm, I'm going to keep it real for a minute. Oh, woe is me. Woe is me. Listen, stop that. Come on, somebody. The only people that show up for a pity party is you and the devil. And he has a field day whenever that happens. Listen, I want you to understand something. It's time to take the limits off God. And when you take the limits off God, God will take the limits off of you. And then those things that seem impossible will be possible. All of a sudden, the super, listen, when you walk in that kind of faith, you're walking in supernatural faith. The supernatural begins to manifest itself. Healings begin to happen around you. You begin to trust God's word when, it's, when Jesus said, listen, I've done some good stuff, but you're going to do greater things than me. See, we have a hard time believing that. But when the lid comes off, you say, you know what, God? I'm going to step into this thing. And I'm going to step into what God says. I'm going to pray for the sick. I'm going to believe that this addiction will be broken, that I will no longer have to worry about my life being so jacked up. Listen, I know that God has victory for every single one of us. And today, you are not a victim. You are a victor. You're the head. You're not the tail. Amen. Today, you're going to walk in victory in Jesus' name. Come on, let's all stand up tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we lift up our hands all over this house just to praise you, to glorify your name, because we know that you're a God with no limits. You're a God that's exceedingly abundantly able to do anything. Help us to believe that, oh God. Help us, oh God, tonight, Lord God, not to walk, Lord Father, with as people with negative thinking and negative mindsets, oh God, because we're unstable in all our ways, Lord God. When we think like that, we just, there's no stability. Father God, those walls of unforgiveness today, oh God, we've decided to forgive those that have hurt us. Tonight, we're going to forgive those. And Father God, forgive us for hurting you. All the times that we said, oh, God, if you would just get me out of this mess, I will serve you. If you just get me out of this place, I'll change my life. And every single time, oh, God, we failed. But today, oh, God, we're taking the limits off. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus tonight. So, Father, help us to forgive the way you forgive us. And help us in our, our unbelief, oh, God. Help us to believe what your word says, oh, God. To know, Lord, Father, that your word is true and anything you say is real. We can count on it, oh God. You're dependable. You're reliable, oh God. And we just thank you and praise you tonight, Lord God.